they described a piece of clothing to me that matched um, one of her favorite sweatshirts that we knew was that we knew was hers. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Gabby's remains weren't positively identified based on hair or DNA or identifying marks. I'm talking about right in the beginning, prior to that first press conference. So it wasn't identifying marks such as tattoos or even Gabby's height that led to the this first positive identification of her. It was an item of clothing, a favorite sweatshirt, that initially led to the tentative realization that the remains were quote-unquote consistent with Gabby. Now in this episode I'm going to take you through the sort of systematic search for the sweater. As soon as I heard the mention of this favorite sweater I wanted to know well what sweater is it and can we identify it through Gabby's Instagram and so I set about the task of doing that. Now I'm sure there'll be uh, there are certainly people who don't know this channel or don't know me who want to jump in. We're at uh, 70 seconds of this video and want to say, you're wrong about that. It's not that. It's You're definitely wrong, whatever. Um, for and, and so those folks, you're welcome to leave and, and head somewhere else. For everybody else, what I want to show you is how we go about finding out information. And some of the things that are interesting is even in this process of being wrong of, of following a lead that doesn't take you anywhere you do think about certain things in a certain way that certainly helps educate you and helps you get to know the people in this case right so that is something that is quite valuable even if you go down something that turns out to be a dead end but before we get to today's episode if you haven't subscribed to the channel please do you can click on the light blue icon on the bottom right of your screen, like, share, leave a comment, and let's get started. So we're going to go through three points here. We're going to look at the sweater. We're going to also look at Gabby's shoes. And then we're going to look at this idea of Gabby's remains being found five minutes walk away from where the uh, transit van was parked. We're also going to look at the uh, video footage of the so-called forest man that was seen in the um, red, white, and Bethune footage approaching the van, right? And, and, and then in the next episode following this one, we're going to take the analysis that, we've, that, that is somewhat foundational in this episode and build on it and see if we can get somewhere in terms of the crime scene. I've heard a lot of people complaining about speculation and you get speculation that is wild speculation that's just sort of random and based on nothing. And that is not what this channel is about. There is speculation on this channel, but it's informed. It's based on a uh, intimate knowledge of the facts, of the people, of the circumstances, based on research. And so it's not really fair to accuse me of, of sort of blind, inappropriate speculation. It's it's the sort of thing an investigator or a lawyer would also be asking questions about. So as regards the sweater, obviously this is speculation, speculation in the area of the, sp of the sweater specifically, but based on information and important descriptors. So this is not just an item of clothing, but a favorite item, not just a shirt, but a sweatshirt. So it's educated speculation around the sp specific thing. And if you think, well, you know, it doesn't really matter what she was buried in. Um, you know, that's not really important. Uh, so what kind of thing? Um, I don't know whether you belong in the true crime thing because all, all details matter. Words matter. All, everything actually matters. Everything's connected. And so this is just one little piece and, you know, you could say, you know what, we'll, we'll know in about six months or we might know in a year. But is it possible to know now? And if we do know now, where does that lead us, right? So that's sort of where we're taking this. So based on this description of a favorite item and a sweatshirt and a, a study of Gabby's social media, I thought this might be the sweatshirt in question. And I must say, Gabby looks really beautiful in it. Um, if it wasn't her, sweatsh her favorite sweatshirt, you can imagine it becoming her favorite sweatshirt. It certainly suits her, I thought. So 
if this is the sweatshirt in question, the next sort of um, problem or issue is, was it purchased at a local store? Because according to Gabby's family, um, it was purchased at a store in New York. Now, would you buy a Zion National Park sweater somewhere else besides the Zion National Park, right? And so you might want to stop there, but if you keep going through Gabby's social media, you see that this sh shirt makes several more appearances, right? So we can't say for certain at this point whether this Zion National Park sweater wasn't purchased more recently while on the road. It's also possible that it was bought during a previous trip, right? But what we can say is that Gabby appears in it more than once. It makes at least three appearances in Gabby's relatively limited social media. This is the second, which occurred during a rainstorm. So just on this descriptor, favorite sweater, do you think that one can include this particular garment in that, in that description? I think you can, just based on the social media. And then here is the third instance. And note the Zion sweater is carefully and neatly folded beside her pillow in the background. And this is on the day following the thunderstorm in Bryce Canyon National Park. Now, what I mean by when we even go down a, a false road or a road that's got a dead end, what you end up doing is you're paying attention. You're looking for something on your way to a certain result. And you often find other things while that's taking place. And so this is quite a good example of that. So my next question was, does the Zion sweater make an appearance prior to their visit to the Zion National Park in 2021? And so that was a much harder question to answer. I did find something dated June 10th, 2019. And it's difficult to be certain, but this sweater from 2019 certainly looks to be a match in terms of color and texture. The sleeve ends, though, seem wider and flatter than the image taken in July in Bryce Canyon. So although it's very close, is it the same one? Maybe not. When we're paying attention to these details, if you look over Gabby's right shoulder in this particular image, you see a small... Um, portrait of the Beatles. It's the, from the album Help. And above that, a picture of a sunflower. And that is also giving you a sense of the kind of person Gabby is. You know, was this taken from her bedroom? Was it taken from the kitchen? Um, and one wonders if you could um, get a wider angle from that, what would you see? Do you also notice what looks like a camera, a type of Instagram, Instamatic type, type camera, above her um, right shoulder um, on the left hand side as one looks at that particular image. And then I think one's got to ask the question, well, does Gabby actually make a direct reference to a shirt that she likes? Does she ever talk about her clothing saying, I really like this shirt? And it, once again, it takes quite a lot of time to to find something like that, but, but there is something. And th this is from May 21st. So a month prior to this image of the stars over her cheeks, and it's taken from the Carolina Beach boardwalk. And she says in the uh, caption to the image, I like this picture and the shirt a lot. And so it's possible that this is the sweatshirt that is being referred to. But at the end of the day, it's very hard to be certain, right? It's hard to be clear. And yes, it probably will come to light what the actual sweater was in time. It will probably be provided in the discovery. I do think the disturbing thing that the identification by sweater shows is the state of poor Gabby's remains. Although there was apparently another victim of a similar age, height and appearance, I think also a young blonde woman, Gabby was ultimately identified not through her actual remains, but by her clothing and then only subsequently confirmed through DNA matching. The degradation of her remains may complicate the investigation into the circumstances surrounding her death. And that brings us to the second point I want to touch on really briefly, which is Gabby's shoes. Now, it's quite interesting in this screen grab from, 
from Gabby's uh, Nomadic Static YouTube video, you can see the shoes, her shoes just outside the tent, but at the same time, it's also just outside the van, on the ground, right in front of the, or of the van door, right? And yes, once again, another match to the shoes, where you can actually see her wearing them, and the shoe, as far as we can see, only one shoe underneath the van, right? It doesn't look like that shoe was put there in the same way that those shoes were put um, beside the tent. It feels more like it was left there or dropped there. Do you agree? It also remains unclear whether the, whether the flip-flop outside the van was Gabby's or Brian's. It's not for sure that it was Gabby's. But from an investigative perspective, one wonders whether Gabby was, wear, was wearing her footwear or whether her footwear was buried with her or not. That makes a difference and that is a bearing on what likely happened. So if she wasn't wearing her footwear, if Gabby was found bare feet, then I think it's likely she was carried to the final burying place. Or is it possible that she was buried with one shoe on? And that brings us to the third point, and I believe this was brought up during the Dr. Phil uh, show, that Gabby's remains were found five minutes walk away. And she would have been right. And it wasn't right. far from the van. It was um, a five-minute walk, you said, something like that. Now, just prior to this comment by Nicole Schmidt, that is Gabby's biological mother, on Dr. Phil, I think it was something she said yesterday. It's around about the 10-minute mark in the second clip titled Gabby's Parents Come Together. It's at this point that uh, Jim Schmidt basically describes the scene where he, um, you know, where he saw the where, where the, the spot was identified where Gabby's remains were found. He describes a fire ring and he describes a flattened impression that to him looks like a, temp, uh, a tent site or a campsite. And so it is easy to assume that something happened inside the van and that something happened, you know, on that far side of the creek bed. And then there was this sort of subterfuge carrying Gabby to this other point. But there's another possibility as well, which is that they actually camped that they had a tent on the other side and that the altercation happened at the tent in the camp. Uh, there was the remnants of a, a fire ring there. And you can see where those rocks have been moved to make the fire ring. There was a clearing where I would assume, knowing I have a similar tent, where I would place my tent, and that opening would face out overlooking the, the mountain range. So that's obviously from Dr. Phil. There's actually a much longer description from Gabby's stepfather about this area. But I'll put a link in the description. It's from about nine minutes into the, into the segment where he describes in a lot of detail, the type of terrain and the type of area that it was, and also that he actually marked the spot of Gabby's grave with, with stones. And there's still a little bit of uncertainty which cross is the one that he left. Um, some appear to be um, you know, higher up on the bank. Some appear to be in the riverbed. It's a little bit difficult to be certain. But the certainly on the Dr. Full show, they do show this image which one would assume is the correct image and that doesn't look like a, an image you know sort of inside the main stream area you know the riverbed of the actual area it seems to be closer to the actual campsite but it obviously is an area that can get snow melt um, and so it can possibly flood to some extent you actually see some sagebrush growing in the riverbed area and so obviously those braided streams um, fluctuate uh, with a change of season sometimes the probably the entire width of that water course is is um, flowing water and other times it is reduced to braided streams such as in the middle of summer i've got to say i always thought it was incredibly un unlikely that you would have a scenario of um, someone carrying someone's remains um, over such open terrain. 
And so I think what is more likely is that uh, Gabby and Brian uh, moved um, to the campsite across from where the vehicle was and then something happened there and then she was buried very close to where they were camping. And in that respect, one wonders what is the relevance of the shoe, the shoe at the van, Gabby's shoe at the van. What's the relevance of that given this context? And so what this brings us to is a scenario where you had the uh, Mary Piglet's incident, Gabby and Brian going for a walk, not just sort of a, a saunter, not just a sort of gallivanting somewhere. They purposefully went to the other side, the far side, perhaps to get away from people, to get away from the road. And then something happened there. Something happened at this campsite and happened close to where she was ultimately buried. So it does appear that there may have been kind of a cooling off period. So, you know, they, they drove in the vehicle, uh, perhaps they argued or whatever in the vehicle, but then there was an escalation while they were camping, while they were sitting together. Um, I would have thought it would be more likely that during the drive to the camp, something could have happened. But it's possible that something happened later on in the night. Now, one also wonders, were substances consumed that night? What could have happened? Or could Brian not sleep that night? What what was actually happening that caused um, the this sort of lashing out subsequently, if that is what happened? And that come, brings us to the fourth and final point I want to address here, the forest man debunked. Have you seen the footage of what appears to be a man moving or digging a short distance from the van? And then he apparently crouches down as it passes by. Well, over 300,000 people have seen it, and by far the majority of viewers gave the slowed down footage a thumbs up. That seems to indicate most found the footage believable, reasonable, and credible, right? How about you? Do you think there's a man moving in the undergrowth? Have you seen the footage of what appears to be the van door closing as the red, white and Bethune vehicle approaches? Well, over 1.4 million people have seen it and by far the majority of viewers gave the slowdown footage a thumbs up. That seems to indicate most found the footage believable, reasonable and credible, right? How about you? Do you think someone is putting the van door closed? Separately, of course, both videos are fairly compelling, but both scenarios are difficult to reconcile not only with one another, if seen as a continuum, but also the story that Gabby seems to have um, been camping somewhere else. And so some of this footage almost seems irrelevant to that scenario. It's possible, of course, that both Brian and Gabby are captured in the footage, Brian secretly planting vegetables or perhaps you know, having a toilet break and Gabby perhaps getting undressed in the van. That's possible. However, in both videos, the assumption is made that the surreptitious movements, apparently surreptitious movements, are Brian. In the one, Brian is digging and hiding. In the other, Brian is hiding inside the van. The TCRS assessment is that the door closing footage is more likely and is valuable in the sense that it potentially provides Brian's exact location at a particular time and date. How likely is it that foul play had already occurred at this point? It's difficult to be sure, but I would imagine that there was no foul play at this point. I don't know how likely it is, given the above assessment, that Brian would be moving or carrying anyone in broad daylight. And I've said this before, reading about or hearing about Jim Schmidt's assessment of what it looked like on the ground very close to the actual crime scene at the Spread Creek camp. Something else I wrote prior to that is carrying human remains for five minutes isn't a pleasant task. And so what, I, what, what appears to be the case here is that they weren't carried very far and they certainly weren't carried for five minutes. This does raise the issue. If Gabby was no longer alive at this point, at the point that the footage was taken, how long could Brian wait for the cover of darkness before odor became a problem? And the answer seems to be that there was already the cover of darkness when this took place. Does that make sense? So I do want you to realize that this particular post was made while some information was still being gathered. And so, um, you know, that's how it sometimes happens when you are uh, getting information and you've got a theory and then they sort of collide with one another and then you find out, well, 
this is actually the most likely um, c- scenario. So in the uh, next episode, we're going to talk about um, something more uh, practical in the true crime sense, um, what likely happened that night, what weapon was likely used, and whether Brian's Instagram provides any clues. What is the major influence driving uh, Brian, uh, the, the psychology, the psychological life of Brian, Brian Laundry. So we're going to be analyzing that in the next episode. Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.